Well, uh, if, if you've got ESPN or maybe ESPN2, you've probably seen every, every few weeks, it seems like there's poker on there all the time. Um, or like the World Series of Poker. And admittedly, I'm not, I'm not much of a gambler, um, but I do like to watch weird people. Uh, and there's just, there's just a lot of weird people, like strange people playing poker. I don't get that. Uh, this, one, this one that I'm watching, uh, the, the pot was $17 million. No joke. Um, everybody else had folded. There's just two, there's two weird guys now left at the table. One, one guy, the guy that I'm following, has is got, is got the, the biggest mirrored sunglasses I've ever seen. They just cover his, he looks like a fly. And, and if you've ever, if you've ever watched poker, like there's no shot clock, right? Like it's just, it's just a lot of waiting. It's just a lot of watching. They're, they're looking for a tell. They're looking for a little, you know, tweak in their cheek or something. It's like, then they're going to manipulate that. Uh, after what seemed like an eternity, just like watching, I'm like, what are, what are they doing? Um, the, the, the guy that I'm watching he just like as cu- cool as a cucumber, as if he's just talking about the weather. He says, I'm, I'm all in. Then he pushes all, all of his chips to the center of the table. As they're saying, I've already burned all my bets. I, I'm like more than positive the guy across the table has just got a pair of twos. So like I, I'm all in. Now, if you're new to a place like this, that's actually what the church is about. More specifically, that's what Jesus is. Jesus in his ferocious work on the cross, he's like, that, that's me. I, I'm like, I'm all in on your account. I'm like doing all that I know to do in heaven and earth on your account. And then our, our role in that is to live in light of that. Now, just, just in case uh, you, you may fall into this ditch of legalism, l- let me just tell you, like our, our identity is not formed or informed in any way by what we do. It is completely anchored in what Jesus has done. Like his ferocious, finished work on the cross completely. That's our, that's our uh, identity. Or, or to, say, to say that another way, when Jesus rises, like we, we rise with him so that we might do the works that he did on planet Earth. Let's say that even a different way. Y- you and I, we're, we're not meant to just sit around and watch. We're not meant to just to be here, to take to consume, to leave, and then have strong opinions about it. We're, we're meant to give our lives away. We're, we're, we're designed to spend it in, in such a way where, where we can say, I put, I put all of it that I am, every, every bit of ambition to the center of the table and say, I'm, I'm all in. I've said yes, and I've given my best yes to Jesus. Right, Paul, uh, he, he doesn't mince words when he talks about this. In, in Ephesians 2, uh, on one hand, he's like, don't, don't forget, we, we're, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, he says, um, we're, we're saved by grace through faith so that nobody can boast. And, and what, what he means by that is that there's, there's nothing that we can do. There's no act of service. There's no check that we can write in which we can hold up a trophy and go, this is what I did, God. And, and somehow this merits me getting into the kingdom. Like he's like, we're saved by grace. Like through faith so that no, nobody can boast about it. But then just like two verses later, Paul says in, in verse 10, he says, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus, anybody remember remember that? To do good works. So we find our identity in the ferocious work of Jesus, and it puts us to work here on planet Earth. So let me say it this way. This is not a pleasure cruise. Now, we're going to have fun doing it. I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise. We're going to have some fun doing this, but uh, this, this is a wartime vessel. And we're, we're going to call you to your position. We're going to call you to action. We're going to call you to work and sacrifice your life for the sake of building up the body of Christ, for the sake of encouraging brothers and sisters, and for the sake of reaching those that are far from him. So unashamedly, in these, these next few minutes, I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to build a little bit of a ramp, and then I'm going to ask you to serve. I'm going to ask you to be inconvenienced. I'm going to ask you to give lots of money in in weeks to come, months to come. I'm going to ask you to to get out of your little circle. Honestly, I'm going to ask you to stop being a selfish, self-centered American. Amen. I'm going to ask you to like give your life away for what matters. Now, with that being said, uh, let, let me begin this way. Gene Twenge has written this little book. It's fascinating, it's, it's horrifying at the same time. The, the name of the book is Generation Me, 
why today's young Americans are more confident, assertive, entitled, and miserable than ever before. So the data in the book is based on over a million interviews. And what, what she does is she says, okay, this, this generation, and by this generation, she's referencing 18 to 30 year olds, okay? And, and it's just data, okay? So if, you, if you're in that category, it's just, just data, okay? It's not an indictment. This, you get to do whatever you wanna do with it, okay? Um, but what, what she finds based on unequivocal data, um, 18 to 30 year olds here in America are the, the most self-assured, self I mean, have, have the, the great, at least externally, have the greatest amount of uh, self-esteem of any generation on planet Earth. Um, and, and yet it's humorous because she, she makes light of this. She's like, it, but there, there's like nothing that it's tethered to. She's like the 18 to 30 year olds. She's like the, the, the million that I interviewed. It's like this huge self-esteem. And they're like, we're awesome because we said so, right? Like there's, there's, there's nothing behind it, right? And, and so she contrasts that to Japanese students in the same category, 18 to 30, uh, who uh, by, by every metric, uh, math, science, technology, work ethic, grit, like just heads and tails above 18 to 30 year olds here in America. Um, when, when the 18 to 30 year old Japanese students like get a C on a paper, they're, they're devastated. Again, little asterisk, huge shame culture in, in Japan. Uh, but they're devastated when they get, when they get a C, right? An American student get, <laughs> gets a C, they're like, say my name. We're like, I did it. <laughs> you know, C's get degrees, right? Like we, we that, that makes sense. Um, and so Jean Twingy, she, she, by the, by the end of the book, she's just disoriented by the data. And she's like, I don't get it. I mean, she's a sociologist by, by trade. She, she's like, it's so strange. She's like, this generation, the high, externally, the highest level of self-esteem, like the, it's on the verge of arrogance. And yet, at the very same time, the highest level of anxiety and depression of any generation in recorded history. And so she's like, why is that? Why? Now, that's the end of the book, so it's like really depressing. It's like, <laughs> amen. Um, uh, I want to offer one, one theory for us. Uh, when, when many of us were growing up, we, we had, you know, loving, doting, uh, overly, uh, just excessive parents that were like, you're amazing. You're the best. You're the most clever, smart. You're, you're a genius, and you're beautiful, and no matter what, you're going to do, you're gonna do some amazing things. And who doesn't want that kind of affirmation? But, but your parents, my parents, were like, you can do anything you put your mind to. If you, you want to be a rocket scientist, you, if you want to do that, you, you want to be a brain surgeon. I know you just failed recess, but if you want to be a brain surgeon, you can do anything you want to. If you, oh, you want to fly the space shuttle, honey? Okay, great. Like, if you put your mind, right? And, and you, you believe that, right? And then you graduate high school. And you realize mama lied to you, <laughs> right? Hello? I mean, you, you're like, I, mom told me I can do anything I want. I, I want to be a lineman for Alabama. You, you weigh a hundred pounds. You, like, you literally cannot be their, their water boy, right? And so by the time you, you, you walk across that stage, you, you move your little tassel, all of a sudden there's this, this disorientation around your ambition, right? And we, we see this really clearly. If, if, you, if you've lived in Tuscaloosa for for you know more than a few years, you can see, if you've got eyes to see, you can see it. This this is a this is a, a, a poison that is rising up in, in a younger generations. So what happens is uh, students go to high school, and there is uh, this belief. Okay, I'm going to go to high school, and I've got to get like crazy grades. I got to get a 4.4 GPA. You're taking all these classes. And, and then uh, if, I, if I can get a 4.4, I'm going to get into the best university. And if I can get into the best university and I can make the best grades, then I can get into the best grad school. And if I can get into the best grad school, then I'm going to be able to get the best job. And if I get the best job, then I'm going to make a lot of money. And if I make a lot of money, then I can get a big house. And I make a lot of big house and I'll, you know, get a spouse that I want. And if I get a spouse, then we're going to have 2.3 children that are going to be compliant and obedient and great. And then we're going to live life. And then what you'll find is by the time you're about 38, you, you're done. You're exhausted. And the reason is you, you've been on this like unsustainable treadmill of like, I got to get, 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 I got to get. And then once you, you get it, because you'll get it. Once you get it and you're about 38, 39, 40, what, what you realize is like everything that you, you wanted, everything that you were told to get, 
You got it by the time you're 40, and all of a sudden, you realize most of it doesn't satisfy. You're just like, oh. And this is why 40, like a huge percentage of men and women, but mostly men, midlife crisis, leave their spouse, get a Corvette or whatever car they can afford, and then they move to the beach. Like, let me start over. And, and so what, what happens is, is guys like me, if you, if, you, if you can spend any kind of time in a place like this, guys like me who are well-meaning, and if I can just say, like, maybe a little bit more gospel-informed. Like, I've got a little bit, for some of you, I've just got a bigger worldview because it's, it's based on, like, Jesus, okay? Um, guys like me will come in and be like, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something really big today. I'm going to ask you to recalibrate your calendar. I'm going to ask you to, to recenter your time around, like, the purposes of God. I'm going to ask you to, like, stop spending all the money on you and start spending more money on other people and, and gospel efforts. I'm, I'm going to ask you to stop being a, like, a self-centered American who wears a WWJD bracelet. I'm going to ask you to like give your life away to Jesus. I'm going to ask you to be foolish in the eyes of the world, but wise in the kingdom. I'm going to ask you to recenter your entire life, to orbit around Jesus and his purposes. And what will happen is in, in hearing this, because I'm just going to do this very shortly, some of you uh, uh, are, are just going to pass. And, and it's just, you know, for, since the beginning of the church, I don't mean our church, but the church, like a, a great number of people pass. And, and honestly, those that pass, like they're just outside the kingdom. It's so like for, for many of you, and, and not maybe many, some of you, like church is just a thing that you do. It's like, it's a check mark. It's a, it's a, it's a place to get uh, some encouragement and build some community. And those are all fine things to do. But some of you are just going to pass and be like, honestly, this life is my own. And I'm going to live my life the way that I want to live my life. And a little bit of Jesus will help. But I'm telling you, a little bit of Jesus will not help. You need, anyway. So then some of you, you're going to hear, you're going to hear this. And um, you're just not going to last here. And we see this a lot. Um, where some of you are going to like, I love it. I love, I love the church services. I love the, the temperament. I love your passion. For, I, love, I love what you guys do, but you just won't make it here at Hope City. And the reason is you're going to get so frustrated with me as the primary teacher and vision caster because it's like every week I'm going to beat the drum and I'm going to call you to lay your life down. Yeah. Every week I'm going to call you to, to John 12, 24, where Jesus says, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed which is what many people in the church are, just single seeds. But he's like, if it dies, it produces many seeds, meaning your life's not for you, it's for many. To be given away, buried, to bear fruit for future generations. Amen. But many of you, you're gonna, you're, you're, it, this message is, is, it cuts, man. It hurts. And, and eventually, you're just going to get tired of it and feel, maybe feel a little bit beat up, and I get it. And you're going to be like, I just want to go to a church where I can sit. And they're not going to ask me to do anything, and they're not going to ask me to give anything, and they're not going to ask me to risk anything, and they're not going to ask me to be uncomfortable. But in, 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 like, God bless you in that. This is not that place. It's just not. And then some of you, uh, just because you're, you know, you're from the South. I'm not from the South, so I'm just, I've just got just enough edge still of Miami. You know, I'm just like, I, um, some of you, you're going to hear this, and because you, you are Jesus people, but, you know, like you, you still got one foot in the world. You're going to hear this, and with like as much Southern charm, you're like, isn't, isn't, isn't what he, that little guy up there, isn't, isn't adorable what he says? And, and you're going to say, like you're going to go home, you're like, that, what he said is right. But not now. In, internally, you're going to say, um, when we have a little bit of more, we have more money, we have more time. When we're 67, 
Um, then maybe like we'll, we'll give or serve or, you know, we, we might do some of that stuff you're talking about, John, but until then, like we're just, this is my life. And, and in between picking up piles of shells on the beach, then maybe we'll do a little bit of that. But I'm just going to tell you, like, it's too late at 67. I'm not saying God can't use you 67 if you're 67 or 77 or 87 or 97. Like some of the greats in the Bible, God used at old age. But when you and I fail to, to live for Jesus in our prime, you fail to leverage some of your greatest yeses. So with, with that in mind, I want to look at just a couple of verses, and then and I'm going to preach short today. I know that was a long intro, but I'm going to preach short because we're going to, we're going to make an ask, and then we're going to, we're going to actually watch a fun video to, to be a, a bomb for the way that I might beat you up for a minute, okay? Matthew, Matthew 9. This, this is not a passage about serving, but I'm, I want to just teach these two or three verses just because I want to get to one word. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. There's so much there. Let, let me just say, Jesus is going around. He's pre- it says he's preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. It's interesting if you, if you read the New Testament. More often than not, you'll see the disciples, the apostles, they're going out preaching the gospel. And then in in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see Jesus not preaching the gospel. You see Jesus preaching the kingdom. This is one of these rare verses where you see Jesus proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And and I think what's happening is this little nod from Matthew where he's like, it's both and. Wherever Jesus goes, he he is good news. He's not bringing good news. Wherever Jesus goes, he is good news. So if you need good news today, it's found in Jesus. But then more profoundly, wherever Jesus goes, he brings the kingdom of God. And if you're wondering what the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of God is the rule and the reign of God, meaning everything in heaven and earth bows to Jesus. Wherever Jesus goes, who is the king of the kingdom, he brings all the heaven and and everything that's submitting to heaven with him. So wherever Jesus goes, he says, healing comes. Wherever Jesus goes, salvation comes. Wherever Jesus goes, there's fullness of life. Wherever Jesus goes, people are being rescued out of darkness and into the light. Wherever Jesus goes, heaven is being brought to the earth. And then the second part of this, and this is where we get a little uncomfortable, is that Jesus is is doing that. And then at the same time, Jesus is going, and I'm inviting other people to do the same. Like, we do not have the redemptive purposes of Jesus on our life, meaning we're never going to go to the cross. Like, we don't save anybody. But there is a redemptive thread woven through every Christian's life in which we are meant to bring the, the work of the kingdom. Wherever our feet go, and every time our mouths are open, and every time our hands are given to serve, we bring the work of the kingdom. Every time we have courage to share the gospel, every time we have courage to lay our hands on the sick, Every time we we step into dark places, the kingdom of God comes. And he's like, that's the invitation. That's the expectation for the person of Jesus. So he says, he comes, he's healing every disease, every affliction. And when Jesus saw the crowd, so he's he's journeying along, he sees people. So what what I want you to think of is not too long from here, you're going to see the feeding of the 5,000. Just imagine, lots of people. And Jesus sees the crowd, and like any crowd, like if you go to Brian Denny, and there's 110,000 people in there, there's going to be a mixture of people, right? There's going to be, there's, there are probably going to be people at Brian Denny that love Jesus, but there's going to be a great Great number of people that like don't know Jesus, have shaken their fist to heaven, are sick, are helpless, are needy, are broken. And, and if you're like me, I see crowds and honestly, I just see inconvenience. I see crowds and I'm just like, I don't have it in me. I don't, I don't have the energy. Like I, I had seven people in my house last night till eight o'clock and they were all family. And I was like, I, I just like snapped an amen. I was like, I'm done. I am done. And Jesus sees the crowd of needy, broken, inconvenienced kind of people. Do you know what Jesus does? You like if you if you ever wonder, like what does Jesus think? What does and more importantly, what does Jesus feel towards a crowd? This is what it says. 
When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. That's the word I want us to hold on to just for a few minutes. The word compassion in the Greek, and I don't speak Greek, but I've got a program that helps me. So if you're like, well, I don't speak Greek, it's okay. The word, the word for compassion here is, is the word splag, and I'm, I'm, this is in the phonics. It's, it's splag nitsomai. Splag nitsomai. And the, the root word comes, it's the same word as like lower, it's kind of gross, lower intestines. Okay? And so it literally means the, the movement of your insides. Now, it's a metaphor, right? But we actually use this metaphor still. Right? If, if something moves you, something you know, causes the needle uh, of your emotions to move a little bit, what do you say? You go, oh my goodness, that moved my heart. It moved my heart, right? Now, nobody's going to be like, well, which ventricle? <laughs> You'd be like, shut up, dummy. I, you know what I'm saying? It's a metaphor. Like, it moved my heart. And so when, when Jesus he sees the crowd, he's like, man, it's like in the deepest places. It's it, like, it's in my guts. And so there's something happening in this unseen place that, that nobody sees, that like nobody can take this. So like, I know that I know that I know like in the deepest places. And when it happens, when it gets down in here, like it inevitably gets, it get, gets out here. But if you never have it in here, it, it never comes out here. Like I, I might be able to guilt you to like, you know, pray for somebody or, you know, serving kids or, you know, go, go on smile, reach to the poor. Like, yeah, I mean, like, I grew up Jewish, man. Like, I got guilt coming out all, every poor, man. Like, I know how to guilt you like, like any good Jewish grandmother. But like that, that doesn't get down in the guts. And so he, he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Why? why? Why did he have compassion? Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus regularly calls us sheep, okay? N- not, I don't think, because we're cute and fluffy. <laughs> he calls us sheep primarily because we're slow on the uptake. We get lost easily. So he sees the crowd, the needy, the broken, the rebellious, and he's like, all he sees is like a people in need of a shepherd. He's not going, these people better get their act together. The day of the Lord's coming. Like, that's not, that's not what he came to do. He's like, I've come to rescue. I've come to serve. That's what I've come to do. There's a, a little book. If you're a reader, I hope you're becoming a reader. It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. I, I've, I've read it. It's only 100 pages, so I've read it several times. And it's actually by an Australian shepherd. And he's got a bunch of sheep. And all the, the book is just basically like how dumb sheep are. It's just story after story of like, here's how dumb sheep are. He tells the story of uh, sheep. They literally will die of thirst, like get dehydrated, die of thirst, when water is like 20 feet away. And the reason is like sheep don't, don't do what's good for them. Like, they, we need a shepherd. And so Jesus, because they're harassed and helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd, and then he said this to his disciples. And then he said, verse 17, then, then he said to his disciples, so j- just imagine, he's looking at the crowd, but then he looks at the disciples, he's like, guys, look at me. I don't want you to look at the crowd. It'd be too easy to get distracted right now. Look at me. Which is what, by the way, like, is my role every week. My role is not to look at you. Like, I see the needs, I feel the needs. My, my role, I, I, I got to keep my eyes on Jesus. Because, like, G- Jesus is the one, like, informing. Jesus is the one doing the forming. If, if it's only about, like, how do I meet your needs, how do I scratch your itch, like, it, it, it's going to go bad. So he's like, in my mind, Jesus, like, sees the crowds, and then he sees the disciples. He's like, guys, look at me for a second. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And the reason is I want you to see what I see. Guys, I, I want you to feel what I'm fe- I want this, guys, I want this to get down in the guts of your soul. Because if it doesn't, you're, you're going to flame out. Like in, in the not too distant future, like I'm going to go to the cross and I'm leaving. 
And if this doesn't get down in your guts, like, you're out. The cost of following me will be too great, and you're going to be out. But if it gets down in your guts, he's like, you'll give your life for it. You'll spend everything you have. Like John Wimber used to say, like, we're, we're change in the pocket of God. He gets to spend us any way he wants to. 